smart foundation, food safety in China, a systemic risk management approach. Um, Professor Huang has published numerous articles in academic journals and in the media and has 11 books in English and Chinese. Uh, and after today, we can all look forward to the arrival of his new book, The Rise and the Fall of the East, Examination, Autocracy, Stability, and Technology in Chinese History and Today, which will be published by Yale University Press in 2023. And he says it's not because he's not done, but because there's no paper because of COVID. So, so we are all going to anxiously wait for that. Um, we will uh, begin with Professor Huang uh, talking for about 45 minutes, and then we'll open for questions. So I will now turn it over to him. Thank you so much, uh, Maddie. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I thought only at uh, MIT we struggle with technology. But <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, let me let me share my screen. Um, okay. Okay, so so uh, um, uh, again, very happy and, and honored to uh, make this uh, presentation. Um, the The title is "The Rise and Fall of Technology in Chinese History." Uh, it is a one chapter. Wait a minute! Uh, I forgot to say one thing, and that is, if you have questions, please write them in the Q and A. Yeah. Okay. And it is uh, based on uh, chapter eight of my forthcoming book. Um, and it has a long title, uh, The Rise and the Fall of the East. And East stands for examination, uh, autocracy, stability, and technology in Chinese history and today. So uh, this is not very uh, academic in the sense that it is extremely broad. It's both history and the contemporary period, uh, four big uh, topics. So I, uh, I apologize for such a, a broad uh, uh, approach uh, on, on, on these uh, issues. And forthcoming from Yale University Press. So, so because it's based on, uh, it's it's one chapter from the book, book. Let me just describe a little bit about what the book is about. Um, so chapter one is introductions. It is uh, unpacking the, the yeast model. And the yeast, as I said, uh, the first E stands for examination. And in the Chinese history, it is the civil service examination system, Kuju system. And the way that I uh, uh, analyze the Kuju system is that it is a scaling instrument. It is an instrument that enable the Chinese government to scale its control over large population, over a large territory. And then I have a chapter on the current uh, uh, system, the Chinese Communist Party, chapter three. And then the part two is autocracy, right? A in the East formulation. And in the uh, Chinese history, it is meritocracy, right? Meritocratic uh, uh, autocracy. And how the exam system was designed to achieve ideological homogeneity. And then chapter five is about the current period and how the political system moved from a little bit more open in the 1980s to a very controlled system uh, today. And then part, part three is about stability as in the East formulation. And chapter six is about how the Kuju system uh, prolonged the imperial system, right? So the, the immortality of the Chinese political system was enabled by meritocracy. 
And chapter seven is about a particular challenge for the current uh, system in China. So if you think about political system in China today, it has done lots of things and has been able to preserve political stability against incredible challenges, incredible odds, right? Think about the great leap forward. Think about the cultural evolution. Think about COVID-19, right? Think about SARS. Think about the stock market crash in, in 2015. All these are incredible difficult challenges for political regimes and many other political regimes collapsed, but the CCP system didn't. But there's one thing that this system is not very good at. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, about passing power from one generation to another generation of, of leaders. So that chapter deals with that issue. And part four is technology. So today's topic, and there I have two chapters, one on history, which I'm going to present, and the other on the current period, you know, AI, biotech, and 5G, right? And, and I'm going to go into that, so uh, I won't spend too much time on that. And then I'm gonna close the book by a normative and prescriptive, uh, pres uh, prescriptive uh, discussion, debating the future of this model is it successful? Is it sustainable? Things like that. So looking forward to the future of what is going to happen. So that's kind of the rough idea of the book. And there are other uh, ongoing and related projects that we are doing. Uh, um, a paper with Claire Young is, is forthcoming from Journal of Politics. And we look at the civil service examination system, how it has uh, from the Ming Dynasty, the data set is from the Ming Dynasty. And we use that data set to, uh, to predict uh, the political survival of the imperial regimes. And then another paper, more theoretical, more formal modeling with Claire Young about the great divergence. Typically when people talk about great divergence, they mean the great divergence between China and Europe in the 18th century. Our paper is on the great divergence in the sixth century, the political divergence between Europe and, uh, and China. And then we have an empirical paper with a number of co-authors on this famous idea in Chinese history. It's called the Great Tang Song Transition. It's an empirical paper looking at what happened during this transition uh, uh, during the Tang and, and Song. The, the principal effect of the transition was uh, political stability. The, the regimes became much, much more stable after the political transition than uh, before. We have, a, we have a very rich uh, data set to look at that question. And then I'm co-authoring a book with a number of Chinese academics we actually already wrote the book, almost 50% of it, first in Chinese, and, and then we decided to uh, first publish it in English and rewrite the book in English. And that book basically is a longer version of chapter eight of, of my today's presentation. Okay. So let me uh, give the outline of the talk today. Um, I, I, I'm always um, aware that I may not be able to get to the end because uh, I talk for too long and I deal with, spend too much time on, 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 on some slides. So I want to make sure that you get the idea of the whole uh, presentation, even if I don't get to the end. So I'm going to preview the results and the main contributions. And then I'm going to introduce the data set, uh, the Chinese historical uh, invention data set, and then the measures of Chinese uh, inventiveness, right? So this is all history. Uh, it's all history. And then I'm going to present based on the data, the patterns of uh, Chinese historical uh, technology. And then uh, I'm going to first uh, talk about what is 
what is uh, uh, known as a state capacities to, to explain the pattern by the first variable, which is a state capacity and something I call scale. I, or later on, I'm gonna explain what that means. And then explain the pattern by another variable, uh, a contestability uh, or scope. Uh, I'm going to explain what that means uh, later. So, so essentially sort of a two variables explaining the patterns of Chinese historical technology. And then I'm gonna end by drawing broader implications specifically on what is happening in China today, right? So that's the idea of the, uh, of the presentation. So let me get to the first the bullet point, uh, preview of the results and the main uh, contributions, right? So the, the empirical result, it, it, the, the big sort of takeaway about the empirical result is that in the 2400 years of Chinese history, right, the fifth century BCE to 1911, there were three eras of Chinese technology. The first era, the peak era, lasted from the fourth century BCE, so roughly warring states period, to the sixth century. Sixth century was, um, was the beginning of the Sui dynasty, Right, Sui Dynasty. Uh, so that's the peak. That's the peak of Chinese technology. And then we have the first decline uh, from the sixth century to thirteenth century. Right. So that's the first decline, and that includes the Tang Dynasty and the Song Dynasty. Right. So these are the two kind of kind of glorious <laughs> dynasties by. Uh, 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 in, in the minds of um, many, many people, and they are very, very glorious. But this is already, China was already declining during Song, uh, during Tang and during Song, relative to the period uh, between fourth century BCE and sixth century uh, CE. And then there's a second decline. So basically the Yuan Dynasty, the Ming Dynasty, and the Qing Dynasty, right? So if you kind of think about Chinese history, the first 1000 years, you know, technological development, te technological leadership, and then it's just one decline after another decline, right? So that's the picture I'm trying to convince you uh, that described Chinese history, right? Using the data that we have uh, uh, constructed. And, and so one big takeaway is that Chinese inventiveness uh, peaked much earlier than commonly assumed. So economic historians of Chinese science and technology, typically, you know, there are others who have a different point of view, but most people would say China began to decline in the Ming Dynasty, right? So there we're really talking about 14th century to 17th century, that period of time, China began to decline. My uh, uh, dating of the decline happened much earlier than that in the sixth century. And that matters. Uh, later I'm gonna show you why it matters to get the timing right. Um, so why does it matter? Uh, it matters because uh, uh, we, we, we need to get the timing right to construct the right causal framework, right? So if you believe that the Chinese decline happened in the 15th century, most economists have that view, right? So, uh, uh, you know, David Lantes and Joe Mokir, most, most economists believe that Chinese uh, began to decline in the 15th century. They pointed to the famous voyage ban, right? So some in the audience may, may know this, uh, the Zheng He's uh, voyage to Africa, to uh, South China Sea, to uh, Arabian Sea, that was from the 1402 to 1433. And then the Ming Dynasty banned voyages and those bans were uh, were uh, renewed for 400 years. So most economists, because kind of fits with the, 
with the economic theory about trade, about uh, you know, trade as a vehicle to transfer technology from one place to another. So most people, you know, Darren Osimoglu and people like that would argue, okay, it is the trade ban that led to the uh, decline. Uh, the other view uh, put forward by Joseph Needham, right? So the historians in the audience will know who he is. Later, I'm going to say a little bit more about him. He believed that the decline began in the 17th century, right? So, so his view is that Chinese decline happened because China failed to develop science, right? So if you look at the West, Galileo, uh, Copernicus, and, 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 and essentially science began to take off in the West in the 17th century, and China was left behind, right? And, and others believe that the Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty brought about a decline because these are the dynasties that suppressed market economy, suppressed commerce, suppr suppressed the merchants. Now, there have been some new historical research that shows actually they didn't quite suppress commerce, didn't quite suppress, suppress merchants. So, so that view doesn't even have the right facts. And the timing is kind of wrong as well, right? If, if we believe our data, um, because it happened much, the decline happened much earlier than the than, than Ming Dynasty. And another view is that Tang and the Song Dynasties are the peak of the Chinese uh, uh, inventiveness, right? And, and people talk about the power of the empire, right? The great, the great empire idea. Um, you know, I, I'm going to show you that Tang and Song were inventive. There's no question about it. They, they were quite inventive, but they were already beginning to decline, right? Uh, so the empire, in fact, I'm going to show you the data. The empires are not very good for inventions, historically speaking, in, in other parts of the world, but also true in, in, in China, especially kind of a politically very unified empire is not very good for uh, inventions. So my dating of the decline would uh, overturn these explanations because um, it happens so much earlier than these scholars uh, believe. Then we need to ask the question, what explain the decline in the sixth century, right? We need to locate uh, other variables. And I believe that it, is, it, is, it has to do with political competition, ideological competition, and to a lesser extent, uh, economic competition, right? And by the way, this explanation is very consistent with the way that scholars, economic historians explain Europe. Enlightenment, Industrial Revolution, Scientific uh, Revolution, right? They, they, you know, they don't explain Industrial Revolution, at least not all of them, explain Industrial Revolution because of the trade um, uh, and or even because of science, right? So, so the, the, the idea that science was behind Industrial Revolution, that's actually a controversial view. Um, so, so, so my explanation for the decline in the sixth century is actually consistent with the explanations that economic historians have constructed about Europe. So I'm very happy to see that match. And this is, uh, I'm going to credit one person, but there are other scholars working in this literature. Joe Mokir, uh, who is an economic historian at Northwestern University. Um, you know, he has this phrase, uh, contestability uh, conditions, right? The contestability conditions really, really mattered for Europe. And I will show uh, in, in, in our work that they mattered for China as well. So, so the basic idea is that before sixth century, China had contestability conditions. After sixth century, China got rid of that and therefore Chinese technological leadership collapsed. So that's kind of the simple, uh, simple uh, 
a simple version of the theory. Um, but but to, to, to go back to the uh, kind of explanation uh, framework, right? So the, so the general uh, theme of this chapter, as well as of the whole book, is about this tensions between scale and scope, right? Uh, technological development and economic development uh, depends on getting scale and scope right, getting that balance right. You need scale, but you also need to get scope. The problem is that scale and scope often have this inverse relationship with each other, right? They have some trade-off with each other. So some countries are very good at scale. Other countries are very good at scope, right? To give you a simple example, you know, uh, uh, the scope of opinions in the US is very wide about wearing masks. It's very wide about uh, vaccines, right? So in that sense, to protect public health, from the point of view of protecting public health, a lot of scope is actually very bad. It, it, it's much better if just people converge on one point of view on, on, on science. But you know, the sad reality is that we don't have that in, in the United States. Scale, uh, China has a lot of scale, but that has its own problems, right? Because you destroy in, uh, freedom, you destroy initiative. So it depends on getting these two things right. Many societies get it wrong, right? Many societies actually don't have either of them, but some societies have one and they don't have the other. So scale, typically we think about scale in terms of government, right? Government is the biggest actor in the economy. It's bigger than any private company in the world. They can get the scale right. R&D spending, public sector in, uh, employment, coordination, implementation. These are the things that the government can do the best. Scope, right? So more about freedom, uh, risk-taking, freedom of explorations and inquiries questioning authority, taking individual initiatives. Uh, and I believe this getting the balance right applies both to history as well as to uh, contemporary China. So let me kind of uh, make that idea more concrete by situating that idea in a contemporary modern setting, right? What is scale, what is scope, right? Scale, we can think about in the United States, support from NSF, from uh, NIH, the Manhattan Project, right? In China, it's Ministry of Science and Technology, right? Made in China 2025. These are all like the scale things that the government can do. A scope, right? In the US, right? Columbia, MIT, you know, we celebrate academic freedom, open science, autonomy of professors, right? China doesn't have a lot of scope, right? Professors are appointed by the presidents. Uh, they don't really have a lot of freedom. Uh, so China doesn't have scope. But China has a lot of scale, right? They spend a lot of money on R&D. They organize the big uh, projects, right? There's a famous paper by Michael Polanyi in 1962 about Republic of Science, right? Republic of Science basically is about academic freedom, it's about open science, right? And, and so US basically has a Republic of Science system. China, I would argue, has a Republic of Government system, right? Republic of Government, government matters, government decision-making. You know, to, to put it very crudely, before sixth century, China got the scale and scope right. After the sixth century, all they had was the scale. The scope completely disappeared, right? So that's kind of the framework that I'm using to explain the changes of technology uh, over time. So let me present uh, the the, 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 uh, the, the general patterns from the data, right? So, uh, so the peak era from the fourth century BCE to sixth century, there's a lot of political fragmentation during that period. There's a lot of diversity of ideology, uh, ideologies and ideas, but also there's 
a lot of government support for uh, technology as well, right? Uh, so it's not just scope, there's also scale. So what happened in the declining eras? China got unified, right? So any <laughs> student of Chinese history would know Sui unified China, but that's actually not the most important thing. Sui so unified China by inventing the civil service examination system. It's really the civil service examination system that preserved the unity of China for the next, uh, uh, for the next uh, 1500 years, right? So it's really the civil service examination system. And then the same examination system demolished ideological diversity. Confucianism became dominant, Buddhism collapsed, Taoism collapsed, right? So during the first decline uh, uh, period, right, between the sixth century and 13th century, there was a weakening of ideological diversity and we have some data to show that. And during the second uh, era, after the 14th, 14th century, there was absolutely no ideological diversity. So everything was uh, Confucianism. But during this whole period of time, the state capacity stayed relatively stable. So what are the main contributions? Um, on, the left, uh, on the right side of the screen, you see two uh, paintings. The top painting is the Zheng He voyage. You know, he commanded uh, uh, you know, like 400 ships, right? Some ships have 17,000 soldiers right? and they reached the Horn of Africa, right? The bottom uh, painting is the small ship uh, uh, of uh, Christopher Columbus, right? So Europe was much more primitive in terms of navigational technology in 15th century. And then China decided to stop the voyages, right? So a lot of people believe that, you know, there's this counterfactual scenario in which if China had continued with the voyages, today we will be ruled by China. Well, maybe we are already ruled by China, but that's a little bit separate story. So, so Pax uh, Seneca, rather than Pax Britannica, rather than Pax Americana. Right, so that's the idea. But if you believe that Chinese decline happened in the sixth century, I, I just don't think that counterfactual uh, scenario is that plausible, right? There's a famous claim by Eric Jones saying that China was this close to industrial uh, revolution in 17th and, uh, and 18th century. Well, actually not that close, right? If China began to decline in the sixth century, <laughs> it's not that close at all, right? Uh, so, uh, so it really, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that I, I'll, um, I'll answer some challenging questions about this, but if we really, really believe that decline happened in the sixth century rather than in the 14th, 15th and 17th century, it really, really changes the way that we think about the global history, um, I think. Uh, so let me skip this and then get to the second uh, bullet point, uh, data set. Right? Um, so the historians in the audience will know who he is. Uh, so I'm just say something about him uh, in case others don't know. My data set is heavily based on the work by Joseph Needham, right? Joseph Needham was a, um, a biochemist by training, but he became famous as a historian of science. And he and his students and colleagues compiled 27 volumes of science and civilization in China. And in this uh, uh, volume published in 1969, he famously asked the question, which is now known as the Needham question, why China failed to develop science? 
why China failed to launch its own industrial revolution, despite the fact it was so much ahead of Europe, right? Um, so my, my work is very much motivated, our work is very much motivated by this big need time question. And we take advantage of the work that he did. So there are two source materials for our database. One is Joseph Needham's Science and Civilization of China volumes. And then there is a separate uh, uh, volume by the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So we use both of these source materials. And it's a massive data construction project collaboration uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Wei Hong of Tsinghua University. And the challenge of doing this is that, um, that there's no fixed format. This is all free form text. So we hired 44 researchers, a research assistants at Tsinghua University to manually go through all these volumes and digitally transfer the information from paper to Excel sheet. You know, I like to tell you, you know, it is a result of, you know, MIT technology. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot tell you that. It's all done by manual labor. Once that is done, then we have uh, MIT researchers cleaning up the data, matching the inventions with a, with a date. Uh, and that takes a while, mostly by manual work as well. Uh, so that took six years. It's a lot of work. Uh, it took six years. The initial, it is still continuing. The cleaning up of the data set is still continuing. The initial run produced uh, about 11,000 inventions. I mean, this is like massive uh, data set. If you look at comparable data set on Chinese uh, inventions, you know, usually they have like 100, uh, 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 sometimes 200. We have 11,000. And the most recent run is that we have 15, uh, thousand uh, inventions. And we also de devise coding treatments of the missing, uh, of the inventions with missing data. The, the tricky thing is to match a invention with a time. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's, that's actually very, very challenging. So let me show you. Uh, so all of that was done in Chinese. Uh, the Joseph Needham's books were translated into Chinese. The Academy of Sciences uh, books were in Chinese and our researchers were reading Chinese, but I present to you the English version of uh, Needham's volume on physics, right? Uh, so as you can see, you know, you have to read all of that and write down the inventions, right? For example, the magnet was invented uh, between the third and the sixth century BCE, and then we will write down that invention. Um, and this is transparent glass beads. And this is Han or Qing. So there's a lot of uncertainty, whether it's Qing or, or, or Han. Uh, so we have some coding rules to, uh, to deal with these uh, uncertainties. Right? Uh, we follow uh, Needham's definition of inventions. Uh, it can be a discovery, can be a gadget, can be a theory, can be a production method. We have no way of distinguishing these four categories. So we're just going to call them inventions. You know, economic uh, economists will say, oh, there's a difference between innovation and invention. We, we are not able to make those distinctions, right? So there's a distinction between science and technology, you know, MIT uh, Institute of Technology rather than the Institute of Science. There, there, there are distinctions. We're not able to make that distinction. So we're going to use, it's a very loose concept. We're going to call it innovation, we're going to call it uh, inventions. We, we have no way of saying which one is invention, which one is innovation. Right? So this is more uh, suited for time series analysis right, comparing different dynasties, comparing different time periods, rather than for cross-sectional uh, cross comparisons, right? So it's not really appropriate to use this data to compare China with, with Europe, right? Because there will be differences in definitions. 
Uh, so Maddie, uh, maybe you can remind me of the time so then I, I, I know when to uh, shut up. Um, <laughs> you have another 15 minutes. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, I'll hurry a little bit. Uh, so let me introduce our measure, right? So our measure uh, is like incredible or simple and, and primitive, right? So this is uh, studying uh, science in a primitive society and we use a primitive uh, measure. It is basically the number of inventions of a dynasty divided by that dynasty's population, right? Per capita inventions. And so it is incredibly simple uh, and I, I will defend it, but, but I'm sure you have questions about, about that measure. So the, it's not per capita, it's per, uh, per million capita, per million population. So for Qing Dynasty, uh, our CDI score is 2.85. Basically it means that during Qing, one million population generated 2.85 inventions. For Tang Dynasty, much higher, like 17, 17.6, 17 right? So it is a density measure, right? And uh, uh, population estimates, historical population estimates. Uh, so we rely on uh, this one scholar from Fudan University, very famous uh, historian from, uh, from Fudan University. Uh, he has the most complete estimate of historical populations of Chinese dynasties. But we also use other historians just to do a robustness check. And the two results are not that different from each other. So we have some confidence, uh, confidence in our results. They are, I'm sure you say, you know, this is really uh, problematic in terms of measures and they are, you know, measurement issues. Um, you know, we have, uh, we assume uniform uh, economic importance of all the inventions. You may, you may have a question about that, right? So basically what I'm saying is that gunpowder is as important as anything else, right? Uh, so so you, you, you may say that's not right. Um, different dynasties have different durations, right? we kind of use the population and we don't normalize the durations. But let me just say, when you normalize the durations, the results are not that different. Um, so you can sort of scale by population and you scale uh, durations on top of that. The results are not that different. There are some small differences, but the results qualitatively do not overturn the larger uh, findings. Uh, you may also say, uh, well, okay, so you have population in the denominator, does that bias against dynasties that have higher uh, uh, populations, right? So, so here I just, you know, I'll be happy to answer that question, but my simple uh, answer to that is that we're not doing math, we're doing economics, right? So if you gave me a theory why higher population, uh, if you gave me an economic theory why higher population has to be associated with lower uh, inventions, then my measure is problematic. But most economic res uh, evidence, uh, that is known by the way as Mar Marthusian logic, which is totally not, uh, uh, doesn't stand up to empirical uh, evidence, right? So most, uh, um, I, I think the more plausible idea is that with higher uh, uh, population, you actually have more inventors. So there's no, this is not doing math. So the ratio is not automatic. Right? Uh, when you have more population, you actually should have more inventions too. Uh, what about using simple uh, absolute measure, just simple count? That actually has a lot of problems. And uh, if people are interested in, in that, I'll be happy to answer, okay? so. There could be other additional measurement issues. I can come back to that during the Q&A. We have political measures. Uh, let me walk through them very, very quickly. Uh, we use uh, uh, this uh, bibliography of uh, famous historical figures to construct uh, two measures. One is government employment of uh, technologists. And the other is uh, a ideological measure 
of how diverse the ideology is, we use information from, from this uh, volumes to construct those two measures. Okay, so let me present the patterns, right? So I only have like 15 minutes, so let me, let me hurry. So, so this is the pattern, right? Uh, Warring state period all the way to Qing Dynasty. So this represents roughly uh, 2,400 years of Chinese history. The first period, right? And these are the CDI scores. The second period and the third period, right? So you can see kind of the stepwise decline, right? Uh, and the first decline, this is a Sui Dynasty. Sui Dynasty was established in 580, right? Toward the end of the sixth century, right? So this is a, a, a more uh, kind of um, a simpler representation of the previous graph. Right, if you look at the CDI score, uh, the first period, uh, second period, the third period, right? So you know, basically the long Chinese history is basically, so the first thousand years technological development, the, then the second uh, 1000 years continuous decline. Um, let me uh, talk about uh, state capacity, right? Um, it is very interesting that when you read the literature on, I mean, I, let me let me just say I'm <laughs> I'm an outsider. I'm not a historian, so for me, I learn so much by reading the literature. I I probably miss a lot of literature, but I just learn so much from reading the literature. It's very interesting that the literature is very rich on explaining the decline but it is not as rich explaining the leadership of Chinese technology, right? Um, so, so I'm trying to explain both the leadership and the decline. And I believe that the leadership of Chinese technology is explained by state capacity, right? The role of the state. If, if you read the conventional literature, actually the conventional literature is actually very negative on the role of the state, right? David Lentis, a famous economic historian from Harvard, right? It is the state that kills technological progress in China. Joseph Needham famously said that there was a Parkinson's law in, in, in Chinese science, basically government created useless things for people to do, right? So he was very, very dismissive of the role of the government. Um, my, my, my view, uh, and hopefully supported by data, is, is actually uh, very, very different. Uh, I believe that China achieved the technological leadership because the government very early on in China supported science. But it's supported science, not like NSF, right? Not like NIH. It's supported science by what I call payroll. Basically keeping a lot of smart people on the government payroll. And it is not specifically targeted on science. As I'm going to show you later, the government, imperial government also kept lot of writers, poets on government payroll. So essentially from very early on, it is very interesting. I think it's very unique among uh, civilizations that the Chinese government like to hire smart people, right? Some of these smart people invented technology, other smart people composed poems uh, uh, and um, and the uh, humanistic uh, uh, creations, right? So that's the way I see it, right? So that actually explains how China succeeded in both technology and in humanistic creations, right? And I would argue it is supporting technology both ex ante and ex post, right? So, so think about this. You are hired as a smart person. You are not hired because you came up with, uh, you know, 
uh, gene editing, right? So maybe in the end, I didn't invent anything. I'm a potential inventor, right? And yet I'm hired by the government. And once I have the government position, then I don't have to worry about farming. I just think about uh, Asian times, right? If you uh, uh, don't receive a government salary, you have to feed yourself, right? So, so basically the framework is that China had this massive class of leisure people, and some of them invented technologies, other invented uh, poetry. Can I just ask you, are you talking about in the first period or throughout? Throughout. I'm going to show you here. Throughout. This is what's interesting. So this is uh, the entire Chinese history. The top line represents the ratio of humanists, right, uh, uh, hired on the government payroll. You know, 95%, 83% throughout the Chinese history. The, you know, there are some fluctuations, but pretty stable. These are technologists. The green line represents technologists. This is from that book, the famous uh, uh, historical figures uh, in China, right? Pretty stable, very high proportion, right? We're talking about 70%, you know, 67%, little bit of fluctuation, but not, but not that much, right? Throughout the Chinese history. So, so, so this is how I tell the story. The state capacity, very stable. Right. If you have a two variable model, right, state capacity and um, uh, and uh, scope, explain the Chinese scientific development. Right. During the first period, you have both. During the second and the third periods, you only have one. Right. You only have state capacity. Right. So that's kind of the simple framework that I'm using to explain what has happened. So let me talk about the scope and then show you the collapse of the scope. Um, the first collapse happened in uh, 580, the Sui Dynasty. And here, this is a very interesting historical coincidence between China and Europe. In Europe, they move in the totally opposite direction. The Roman Empire collapsed in five, uh, 476, right? Basically the collapse of Roman Empire gave the Europe today, right? Germany, England, France, and all that. Before that, Europe was unified. 100 years later, China went in the opposite direction. China was divided uh, uh, between 220 uh, and 580, and then China was like Europe during those 360 years, and then it got unified, right? So, so this is the political divergence idea that Claire and I are writing about. They went in the opposite direction. Uh, let me skip this. Um, and and um, so the first shock is the end of the political fragmentation. That's the first shock. So China became unified. There was still some ideological diversity, even though during this period, the ideological diversity declined, but there's still some ideological diversity, especially during the Tang uh, Dynasty. During the Song, it began to decline substantially. During the third period, you have political unification, empire, right? A Qing Dynasty, uh, a Ming Dynasty. And you also have the absolute dominance of Confucianism, right? We have data to show that. But the payroll function of the state remained the same throughout this whole period, right? So that's the important thing I want to emphasize. The state capacity didn't decline. And the Zhenghe voyage was a classic example of state capacity. Right, classic, you know, China, uh, made in China 2020, classic example of state capacity. Uh, this is a, a scatter plot showing the inventiveness on the vertical axis, territorial size on the horizontal axis, 
the bubble is scaled to the size of the empire. There's a clear kind of a downward slope. Uh, the bigger the empire is, the less inventive the dynasty is, right? I mean, we can go into, uh, so the two-way correlations is negative um, uh, uh, four, uh, uh, four eight, uh, point four eight, and we can sort of divide this into sort of big empires and small empires and kingdoms, but the pattern holds, right? Bigger empires are less inventive than smaller empires like Yuan, a Tang is, a, is an empire, Yuan is an empire, uh, Yuan is a bigger empire than Tang uh, uh, as an empire. Ta Yuan is less inventive than Tang. We have kingdoms, right? So these are not empires, but kingdom. Bigger kingdoms are less inventive than smaller uh, kingdoms. The bigger you are, the less inventive you are. Let me single out one period to illustrate the importance of scope. And this is a period that I call Han Sui Interregnum. In the Chinese history, it is known as uh, Wei, Jin, uh, Nan, South and North uh, Kingdom, right? Wei, Jin, Nan, Bei, Guo. It's very difficult to pronounce. So I, I, I created my own, uh, my own terminology. Han Sui Interregnum. The famous period is uh, uh, Sangui Yan Yi, right? Three kingdom, romance of the three kingdoms. As kids growing up in China, we all read uh, the, the romance of the three, ki three kingdoms. That is the peak of Chinese technological development. That's the peak. Um, let me show you, right? In terms of the ratios, it is uh, 2.13 to Song, right? Song is usually considered very inventive, but this is twice as inventive as Song, almost twice as inventive as Tang, right? About 1.6 times as a Han, dynasty, a Han Dynasty. Look at Qing Dynasty, 10 times as inventive as Qing Dynasty. So I'm very curious, right? What happened during those uh, 360 years? This is an excellent book by uh, Professor Walter Shadell. Uh, last week, I made the same presentation to a Stanford audience, and I was very happy to have him in the audience. Uh, he was a professor of classics. I recommend this book. The basic argument of his book is that Roman Empire collapsed in 500, uh, sorry, uh, 476. That collapse created political uh, competition ideological competition, economic competition. And that competition gave us GDP growth, democracy, rule of law, and technology, right? So I would argue China was Europe before Europe was Europe, right? Europe became the kind of Europe we're familiar with, like Brexit and all of that. After 476, Right, Han Sui period was very similar to Europe. Political fragmentation. There were 31 concurrent or consec consecutive regimes, right? After that, there's just one. After Sui, there's one, that's it, right? Uh, contestation of ideas. There's a famous uh, concept called the Qing Tan, right? Argumentative, right? So Amartya Sen wrote a famous book about India, argumentative Indians. There's a discussion of democracy, right? Highly abstract thinking prevailed. A lot of criticism of Chinese philosophy is, or Chinese uh, uh, philosophy is not abstract. You find abstraction during that period. Two fundamental mathematicians uh, 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 in Chinese history, both of them, lived in that period. Intellectuals were semi-independent from the government. You know, they are still connected to the government, but they were semi-independent from the government. After Sui, because of the civil service examination system, all the intellectuals became government, uh, government uh, uh, employees.
during this period, there was a flushing of humanities as well as flushing of uh, technology. Okay, so I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. Uh, we have a measure of um, the number of humanistic creations, right? Poetry, essays, and things like that. Uh, Han Sui interacted and peaked, right? As well as technology. So this is, to me, this is a Renaissance. This is Chinese Renaissance. You have flushing of humanities as well as flushing of science and technology. Warring states, which has the second highest CDI score. You know, Warring states is a very famous period, right? Bai Jia Zhengming, you know, Confucianism, legalism, Taoism, same idea, right? Very diverse, seven kingdoms competing with each other. And that gave the Chinese uh, scientific and technological uh, 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 progress. So let me let me just show you some data on ideological homogeneity, right? This is the share of a Buddhist among Chinese prominent Chinese historical figures. Tang Dynasty was the peak. Sui Dynasty is the second peak, so it doesn't match exactly with our data. But remember, though, Buddhism came to China in the first century, right? So, so this Buddhism just arrived in China around this period of time. Very, very quickly, it attracted many, many followers. So I would argue that the Tang Dynasty, the height of the Tang Dynasty, was the momentum of the previous rounds. This is the share of a Taoist among the historical figures, and it collapsed during the second era of decline in the Ming Dynasty, right? So Buddhism began to decline during the Song. Taoism collapsed during Ming, right? And this is by Chinese uh, historians. So let me go through this very, very quickly. This shows you the share of Confucianist documents of the total number of the court documents, right? Before Song Dynasty, that ratio stayed around like 40%. After Song Dynasty, it rose to 70%, 80%, and 76%, right? So many people believe that it was the Han Dynasty that established the homogeneity of Chinese ideology. If you actually look at data, the homogeneity happened much later. It matched with the second era of our technology data, OK? So let me uh, just end by drawing. Uh, I actually have 100 slides, but I put those in the appendix uh, on, on today, right? Uh, so I believe. Even for today, both scale and scope matters. Scope conditions are like autonomy of Hong Kong. In my other chapter, I show how many high-tech Chinese entrepreneurs use the rule of law in Hong Kong to protect themselves. Chinese universities don't have freedom of speech, don't have freedom of explorations, but they have access to those uh, freedoms by collaborating with Western <coughs> The problem now is that the, 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 the current government, the current leadership is undermining these con conditions. And this is very problematic going forward. Okay, Maddie, sorry I go over. Let me, let me stop there. Okay, I want, this is so controversial. My head is spinning. So uh, <laughs> sorry. I will, I will invite people to quickly uh, type in their questions. We probably will not get to more than a few of them. Um, and while people are doing that, please, please type your questions into the Q&A. Ah, somebody has just done it. Do you, can you present it live? I, I, I don't know. Can he present it live? Uh, I, can, I don't think so. I'm not sure how a webinar works. So if you could write it down, this is Don Clark, not unless you have a way to turn on people's audio. My person should be here, uh, Weatherhead, 
Can, can we turn on Don Clark's audio? Uh, yeah. I don't know how to do this. Is she, she should be there, but I can't see her. Uh, um, okay, he's going to type his question. If uh, Did you find any correlation between Confucianism and the development of technology? You know, you talk about negative, do you see any positive correlation? No, I mean, in the sort of grand scheme of things. So, so first of all, let me, let me say that correlations here are uh, very crude correlation, visual correlations, because we don't have many uh, numbers of observations. Um, and so, so don't, so hold me to the, to the standard of econometrics. Uh, in terms of the, the, the kind of broad correlations, the broad correlations are massively negative, are massively negative. Those dynasties that only have Confucianist ideology are the least inventive. But I'm not claiming Confucianism itself is bad for technology. What I'm claiming is having one ideology, no matter what that ideology is, is bad for technology, right? So if you have legalism, Right, Fajia, if you have legalism as one single ideology, that can also be bad for technology. Right? So without kind of competition, it is not good for, um, uh, for uh, technological development. Interesting. Uh, we have another, another person who's wondering, and I think I confess I wondered myself, uh, what do you think of Wang Anshu's reform and its relationship to industrialization? Some say it almost yeah. pushed China to industrialize. Well, uh, to be self-consistent, I have to dif dis disagree <laughs> with that. Um, I actually see Wang, in terms of long-term uh, effect of Wang Anshu, I see a lot of harm of his reform. So if you think about his reforms. First of all, of, why don't we, for those who don't know, why don't you tell them when Wang Anshur was? Uh, well, so Matty, you're the historian. So I, <laughs> I, I think he, he was in the- uh, In the Song Dynasty. In the, the, the Northern Song Dynasty, right? Northern yeah. Song Dynasty. And his reforms, uh, one of the key piece of the reforms was making educational opportunity more available to the population. Right? So that's the part that I pay attention to because I have a whole chapter on the civil service examination system. And he advocated basically universal education. You know, when I say universal, it's really boys, uh, male uh, uh, population, not, not female population. And that was good in in many, many ways, right? When you have basic literacy, uh, there's a very interesting book by Joseph Heinrich uh, about um, literacy and the brain changes uh, induced by literacy. Uh, if, if the brain is exposed to literacy, your brain is wired differently. You know, he's a, he's a biologist. Uh, so that was very good for that. Um, but the downside of that is it totally crowded out any other ideologies than Confucianism. So if you think about the Koji system, there's one ideology, Confucianism, right? And there's a close association between the implementation of the Koji, the civil service examination system, and the homogeneity of Confucianism, right? So even though the civil service examination system was very good in certain technical narrow sense, right? It was bad for, um, for the ability to come up with new ideas, right? Think about the Baguwen, think about the eight-leg 
uh, essays, right? Uh, it's just terrible for creativity, terrible for uh, originality. So uh, it it seems to me, and I'm, uh, maybe we'll go on from this, but I just want to throw in my two cents that in some ways what you're saying is less what what the actual quality of the ideology was, but the fact that people's, and this is an old argument, that people's energies are all being yep. directed towards taking these examinations, that this was the main source of status, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's one of the issues you maybe have to confront. Is that actually the case? And if not, what was the constraint that made people focus in that direction and not open up other 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 avenues towards status, which certainly emerges in the in the late 19th century but can i go on to another question sure sure um uh one of our colleagues alan die at whose students are here asks he says the invention data set is impressive i agree have you considered classifying inventions in some way to capture relative economic importance yeah just yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 i i know the uh, question is going to come so uh um <laughs> Um, I get I get that question a lot, uh, and so first of all, just kind of a, 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 a trivia, uh, um, a factual trivia. I didn't know until I began to do this that Chinese invented brandy, Chinese invented umbrella, Chinese invented whiskey. Um, so, so, so to this question, here's my difficulty, right? So how do I, how do I know gunpowder is more or less important than brandy, right? So I don't really have any objective way of assigning a weight to a particular invention. You know, in some situations, gunpowder is very important. Right. I have to say, after this seminar, I think brandy will be more important than gunpowder to me. Right. So, 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 so that's one reason. Uh, I just this is just my ignorance. Maybe a smarter pe person can do it. The other reason is actually more important, which is the following. The reason why we are talking about China now is because China failed to industrialize. What does that mean? It means that China didn't use any of its inventions. The economic importance is coming from the usage of the inventions, not from the fact something was invented by itself. So essentially gunpowder, you know, the Song Dynasty did use gunpowder, but later on, you know, as we know, right? So China couldn't uh, couldn't fight uh, against the British in the in the nineteenth century because China didn't develop military capabilities as a result of the gunpowder. The economic importance all happened in Europe. Compass, right? Zheng He probably used the compass, but after that, China didn't sail. The economic importance was European rather than Chinese. So if I say that gunpowder is more important than something else, compass is more important than something else, then I say Song Dynasty is more important than Tang Dynasty. But only, but the following has to be true, which is, yes, Song Dynasty is more important to Europe than Tang Dynasty, right? But that's not my concern, right? So my concern is I'm comparing Tang with Song I'm comparing Song with Qing Dynasty. I don't care whether Song Dynasty is more important to Europe uh, as compared with another dynasty, right? So, so that's the that's the substantive answer why we shouldn't actually weight these inventions. We just assume all of them to be the same. Right? Let me let me ask you a similar question. This one's coming from Don Clark, um, and and he, but he says, by the way, amazing work. And then he says, um, I, I, I'm guessing you chose to organize the data by dynasty because of a sense that each dynasty represented a particular cultural orientation. 
If so, I wonder if it might be helpful to address that question directly to decide for yourself how to periodize Chinese history in terms of particular cultural orientations yeah. instead of using this dynastic measure that has the advantage of being objective, you didn't make it up, but isn't really intended for your purpose, and then see what patterns develop. And, and this is related, so I'll just throw it in. What happens if you try to organize the data purely chronologically, taking particular chunks of time of equal length? Yeah, so Don usually asks the toughest question, so, uh, <laughs> and, and this is not an exception. Um, that's an excellent question, uh, by the way. And uh, by the way, Don, we are doing that. Uh, the, the reason why we are classifying these things on the basis of dynasties is because Joseph Needham did it, right? So, so if you read his book, usually that's what he said. He said, okay, uh, X, Y, and Z was invented in Qing dynasty, something like that. So that's the easiest way to classify these inventions. But he does give bits and pieces of information about a specific time. We are doing that now. We are able now to look at the inventions for every 100 year interval, right? Rather than you know the whole Qing dynasty, the whole dynasty. The problem with that is uh, there are a lot of missing data, right? So think about Han Dynasty. Well, it lasted more than 400 years. Was it in the first 100 years uh, when Joseph Needham said something was invented in Han or in the second 100 years and, and third 100 years, right? So by doing that, it gives you more precision, but you don't, you lose a lot of information at the same time, right? So, so that's the dilemma that we have. And you know, and and, uh, uh, um, and and also another uh, down another challenge is that the population estimates are given by dynasties, right? So we need a denominator, which is measured in terms of dynasty. We need a numerator, which is usually given by ne by Needham in terms of dynasty. So. So the matching is much easier if we do it that way. But but we are we are trying we are trying and 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 as we speak we are still doing that. So I don't have any results to share as of today. So this is a lesson for students that the data doesn't always let us do what we want to do. No, <laughs> especially historical data, right? So yeah. uh, I, I I I actually, Don is one of the first persons who said, "Oh, this is impressive." because he recognizes how difficult it is to do this. I usually get very nasty questions. Because, oh, this is such a primitive uh, analysis. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, Don. Well, I have, a, I have an, ana an anonymous um, questioner who has a question. I don't think this is a nasty question. I think it's a very uh, you know, thoughtful question and, and, and one that I wondered about myself, and that is, um, but, but I have a, an idea of how you're going to answer it. But in any case, um, you you talk about Confucianism and the kind of homogenization of, of ideology. But this person says Confucianism became the imperially endorsed ideology during the Han Dynasty, which of yeah. course has the highest CDI according to your theory. Um, no, no, it but, doesn't. Oh, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Well, okay, but it's close. It's in the. It's in the. It's, it's in the high yeah. period, right? Yeah. Um, but Confucianism was evolving over the dynasties, and it absorbed various different ideologies like Buddhism sure. and Taoism. So, yeah. right, there's so, so no me, question me, mark. <laughs> okay, so I, I think that's a very good question, and and let me let me clarify a little bit. Um, it. I, that's what I used to believe, right? So Han Dynasty established, Han Wudi established uh, Confucianism as the official ideology, I think in 140, right? Something 142, something, something like that. And that, that's how many scholars uh, kind of take it for granted. Okay, so that's the official ideology now. If you look at data, that's actually not true. 
Uh, it, it, no, no, no. Uh, let me say it's, it's true, but there's a difference between. Okay, so let's look at China today, right? M maybe before Xi Jinping, China said that it is a communist country, right? So I mean, that's just Han Wudi, right? Saying Confucianism is the official ideology, but we know for a fact there's so many Chinese who don't believe in communism, right? So in our measure, we actually pick out between until Song Dynasty, there was quite a bit of ideological diversity, even among uh, 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 prominent historical figures, right? Buddhism and Taoism and things like that. But, but that paper by the Chinese academics, Confucianism documents accounted for only 40% of all the documents during the Han Dynasty. It was 70% during Song, right? So, so, so it's, it's not quite right to say that Han Wudi said Confucianism was the dominant ideology and then overnight it became dominant uh, ideology. You are absolutely right that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trashing Confucianism, by the way. Uh, 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 Confucianism has absorbed other ideas and, and things like that. I think it's not so much what specifically Confucianism is about that is bad for science, right? So let me kind of repeat what I uh, said to Maddie. I think it's really the ideology itself, right? You know, you could make an argument, even if you have hegemony of liberalism, that's also bad too, right? So the important thing is to have multiple ideas, right? Where you have just one idea, it, the idea absorbs other things, but there's not much competition. That's actually bad for originality and creativity, especially served by a powerful civil service uh, exam system. So I have, um, I'm going to try and get in two more questions. Um, one is, um, is from Dale Finlayson, who asks, do you find that there's an upswing in invention at the end of dynasties when there is less political and ideological control? Yeah. And the other one, so you can figure out how to spread your time, uh, is from Yuan Yi, who is a former PhD of ours and is now a, a postdoctoral scholar who works on technology. And she says, if we move away from invention towards use, in narrating the history of technology, which as you, you just laugh because you know it's a recent trend in the history of technology, yeah. how would that affect your narrative? Yeah, okay, so these are really tough uh, questions. Uh, let me maybe answer in the reverse order. Um, I, I want to learn, I mean, I, I'll get in touch with Yuan Yi, and, and I want to learn how to measure deployment um because I, I i i the honest answer is sitting here you know uh on a tuesday evening i i really don't know i i really i i i i can i i have an idea about that but i don't know how to operationalize the deployment uh so so i'll get in touch with 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 uh, with you about that um in terms of paradise within a dynasty, uh, that goes back to uh, Don's question. Um, th then we have to uh, come up with a measure that is granular enough to distinguish between early period and later period. Maybe one year from now, I, I will have something, uh, but uh, as we speak, we are doing that. We are, we are sort of divide the, um, the data into 100 year interval. Uh, and then we can say maybe early Tang was more inventive than later Tang. But at this point, I don't have anything to report because we haven't finished that work yet. It's a massive amount of work. Um, yeah. Well, I think I'm going to have to stop there. I could think of about 20 questions I want to ask <laughs> you. So maybe at some point we'll, we'll get together. Um, but I really want to f thank our, our audience. They, they asked such thoughtful questions, and I'm sure there were a lot of people who had, had, had questions as well that they didn't have time to ask. 
Uh, and thank you, and I'm so sorry that we got started a little late, um, but it was really well worth waiting for. And, you know, it's, if I can just say it in closing, um, the way in which you're approaching this really, I think, has an op gives us an opportunity to test a lot of the very, you know, massive number of theories that people have about Chinese technological development, but which haven't had any, any real concrete data, um, comparative data over the long, long span of Chinese history to, to really work with. So, so this will be an interesting, I think, first step, and I think there'll be a lot of people who will be building off of what you've done. And as, as Don said, it's an incredible job to put these data sets together. Um, and we want to thank you for that. And thank you again. I'm sure everybody would join me in, in clapping and, and uh, looking forward to the next stage. Thank so, you, Maddie. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Goodbye. We're done. I'm going to turn this off. <laughs>